Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Sophia Koziakis. I'm the EMIS Pro Project Manager, so EMIS standing for Education Management Information Systems. Um, I'm just one person in a beautiful team of people who are looking into the education sector, trying to learn what we can from the health sector while keeping our eyes very wide open about the unique intricacies of how children and youth are learning in, in uh, schools and, and beyond. So that's the reason why I wanted to put this picture up for us before we kick off our session, just to remember, to remind ourselves that for the majority of children, adolescents and youth across the world, the journey to reach to the top, to lead a life that you have reason to value, whatever that might mean for you as an individual and where you live, is not an easy journey. It's a big uphill climb. And for many, many children and youth, one small drop, one small blip can mean that they will never come back to school. Um, and even though we have been working for many years to ensure we have children in seats and classrooms, we are now learning that they are not learning. So by the age of 10, we have many, many, many uh, learners that aren't able to read and understand a simple text. So it's just a reminder to us of why we're doing this, why DHIS2 is exploring. And when I say DHIS2 for education, and we really should say DHIS2 and the HISP network for education, because it really, it takes a village. So a very brief glance, I'm not going to spend too much time here because you'll get the slides, because we have a beautiful lineup of folks um, who are going to be speaking today. But just to, to give you a snapshot of the six partner countries we currently are working with, we have gone national scale with tracker and aggregates in the Gambia, many learning still with tracker. We have gone national scale with uh, the Kingdom of Eswatini. We are working in Togo, Uganda and Mozambique, as well as Sri, Lan uh, Sri Lanka, with much, much growing interest, which Christine will speak to at the end of this presentation and we'll go into more detail in our parallel session. So we are looking at finding that key of being able to get data into the hands of the decentralized, that middle tier, decentralized uh, district level, even trying to see if we can go further down to school level, to those head teachers and to their school inspectors. We're trying to understand equity, inclusion, quality through the tracking. We asked yesterday, why are we doing this tracker in health? We're trying to learn from you and think the same. We are very importantly not coming in to replace systems where they work, where capacity has been built over many years. As CHIS2, what I love is that we can come in and we can play nice with existing systems and maybe find a hole that that system cannot fill where we can maybe complement. We are so lucky to be reusing all the software features of DHIS2, maybe doing a tweak here and there and there and asking very nicely. We have so much capacity from the HISP network to help us reuse all that skill that is in country. It is in region. Oslo doesn't often fly to our different partner countries. And then very importantly, something that's building beautifully is university collaborations. Our associate professors, our supervisors, et cetera, and the research team are really working hard at this. So are the HISP groups. And we have a beautiful team of amazing PhD and master students, so I'm, I'm proud. Um, I want to pass it over to a very, a very wonderful person, C.D. Jello. He is uh, in the EMIS team at the Ministry of Education in the Gambia, and he's also a PhD candidate. So we are really lucky to have you here in Oslo, C.D. Welcome. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Sophia, for the introduction. Um, as you uh, as you could realize, um, this should be a piece of cake for me um, as an educationist and also as a researcher on EMIS. But this is one of the hardest presentations for me to make because standing in front of uh, health and convincing them that education needs a share of the funding is not exactly easy. Uh, but that's exactly what I'm coming to do. So, um, but let's start uh, by um, imagine if as health officers, as um, stakeholders in our various disciplines, if the education level of, you know, the population that we are dealing with is a little bit, you know, in, uh, increased. 
So how easier it would be for us, you know, when we are dealing with them, um, I assume it's going to be a lot less time spent with them because there's a little bit of, um, there's actually a lot of research that has gone into linking education you know, with a positive correlation with the, the health of a uh, population. So the more educated the population is, um, the more that they are likely to seek preventive care instead of create um, creative care, if that is the right word to use. So um, we have also, in terms of um, you know, uh, last uh, last um, conference and this conference, there's a lot of talk of intersex um, cross sectoral linkages and and stuff. So we in 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 education itself. There's a lot of possibilities for health and education to, to collaborate, you know, when the education system is, is up and running. We have um, examples where, you know, health, we are using education infrastructure, so education institutions, you know, to, to conduct vaccine tests and stuff. But in, Gam in the Gambia, that was during COVID, but in the Gambia at the moment where I've come from, we have, I'm talking about as recently as last week, we have the Minister of Health itself leveraging education structures to try to get outreach programs to children that are in the communities, to parents that are in the communities. Because in our schools, we have um, mothers clubs, we have PTA associations, we have all of these um, associations that are co really connected to the schools. So the Minister of Health is leveraging these structures now to try to get to the parents of these children that are in the school. And um, for this specific program I'm talking about, it's not even trying to look at the population that education was trying to capture. They were looking at for a vaccination program of the infants that was even out of the population domain of, of education. So this just how shows how, you know, working with the Minister of Health and Education together could be very, very influential. And the target group of education is from, the th from three years old all the way to nine, 19 years old. And there's a big chunk of, of you know, the health, you know, target population too, I believe. And we get, with the goal of education is to make sure that every child is enrolled, universal education, every child is enrolled in the school. And I think that's going to um, centralize most of, you know, the target population of um, the health in, in school. So when it's time for vaccination programs, when it's time for immunization programs, instead of targeting the schools, instead of targeting the community, sorry, you can target the schools themselves where bulk of the population of, you know, um, those vaccination programs are, for example, you know, cervical cancer, immunization, you know, for the young adults, um, especially the girls and so forth. It can be targeted at the schools instead of going to the communities, which is a much more um, and difficult and expensive. So with this, I believe achieving you know, universal education, making sure that every child goes to school is a topic for everyone, including the, the health personnel. So what education has been with this part, this importance has been forgotten for some while. The right to education was specified in 1948, but it was not up till the years leading up to um, 1990 towards the Juneteenth conference where most of the education stakeholders were uh, met and sat and start talking about, we need to start to make this a reality. That was the time that you know they started thinking about how are we going to make sure that every child goes to school. Then there was this you know education for all network framework a framework that you know tried to make sure that every child is you know achieves uh, gets free and compulsory education from the government. And starting from those years, people started to talk about you know how are we going to make sure that we plan in terms of policy, you know, in terms of resource distributions, and also we monitor whether we are achieving our targets. That is why, you know, Momentum started to build around this thing that we call EMIS. So in, in summary, um, this is one of the um, most comprehensive de definitions we have of EMIS. So it's, um, in terms of usage, is to collect, you know, integrate like most health information systems. And the specific purpose is mostly to support decision making and policy planning and resource, resource distribution and stuff. And uh, um, the components, as you know, usual, is not in this social technical in nature. It has, you know, people, technology, uh, models, uh, methods, and all stuff integrated to make sure that it's not only the system of technology that we are talking about. So, in terms of qualities, what makes a really good MS is it has to be comprehensive in the data that's collecting. It has to be integrated. It has to be reliable. It has to be un un unambiguous, and it has to be timely. Most importantly. Because most of our education system at the moment, you collect data at the beginning of the academic year, but it's not ready until the end of the academic year when it's not useful. Then you start the next academic year with data of the previous year. So I don't know how you can make accurate decisions with that. So that's presenting a lot of problems. 
And some of the key stakeholders in education are, are, are you know, the teachers, the parents, and your know, community in the education. So these are very key. So I mentioned, you know, the communities. I mentioned the PTAs. I mean, mentioned the, vid, the village development committees who are key in, you know, uh, in education. So um, traditionally, education data, you know, talks areas like uh, students, you know, data, uh, no, teacher data, infrastructure data, facility data water and sanitation data, um, resources, finance, and um, and the kind of indicators that we look at, you know, in this traditional MS is to look at access indicators, how children are coming into the school, you know, we talk about the intake rates, you know, how many of the, you know, the new uh, ones that are being born are being absorbed into the system, we talk about gross enrollment rates, we talk about, you know, um, uh, um, uh, we talk about integrates also and new entrance into grade ones. Then we talk about also have equity indicators that we also measure the share of girls. That's one and the parity index across all the other indicators. Then we have um, input indicators that is in terms of the resources that the central government, the ministry, and everyone is putting into the education system. So you know we have you know the teachers that are there, the books that are there, the furniture that is in this post and all that are input indicators that are crucial in, in learning. Then in terms of output, you know, we look at, you know, retention, you know, we look at transition, how our children are moving from one level to another. And, you know, most importantly, completion rate, how much of the students that are coming in are going out because that's one of, the, are coming out at the other end because that's one of the biggest measurement of, of indicators in, in, in education. So, Let's fast forward from, you know, the 1990s when we had this kind of design for MS and, you know, the um, the thinking around MS was mostly uh, uh, this area. But the, the most of education systems at the moment is configured and are still thinking the same way. But the rules have changed and, you know, the games, the game have changed because we are now presented with many problems that, you know, um, that we need uh, to shift somehow to try to address. Because um, in, in, in many of our countries, including Gambia, I'm using the Gambia because one is, um, that's where I come from, obviously. But two, because on average, most of our indicators are you know, uh, average in compared to other regions in the sub, in the sub region. So uh, we have um, um, established schools everywhere. So we have a policy that says two kilometers for every lower basic school in the country. So, and we have done that since in the nineties and we have monitored that and we have made sure that there are schools everywhere. But um, as a result, we have our GR is more than hundred percent. That means technically we have created space for every child that needs to be in the school at the LBE level. But our net enrollment rate, that is the actual population that should be in school is only 80%. That means one out of five that we need to target are not in school at the moment. And how do we, how can we find them? This existing system cannot let us know because we need to individually identify them. We need to know where they are, why are they not going to school? Then we can bring them, bring them on board. And um, um, at, the, um, at the end of the 20, the, the policy period from the 2005, from 2000 to 2015 coincided with the MDGs, and the MDGs also was pushing its weight behind, you know, trying to improve access. Now in its report, it has um, shared with us that um, even though we have created all the schools, but there are challenges in terms of, um, you know, the distribution, you know, uh, in many of the girls by, for instance, are uh, suffering more from, you know, the dropout, dropout is affecting more, more of the girls than, than the rest. And then we have, um, and then we have, um, the teacher supply in terms of the rural and upper um, distribution teachers are uh, mostly considered in lower and not in the upper section. And then we have um, and the special needs that are mostly left, left out in, in planning. And these are people that we really need to um, um, focus on. So to drive this, we need to make sure that we look at another kind of MS that can help us answer this question, help us solve these questions. And that is why you know, we are looking to move away from the, the MDG team of access to the SDG teams of learning to collect um, demographic data, to collect assessment data, you know, to look for data, not just to collect it, but for practice and action.
to look um, instead of the the, the, this, the centralized approach of you know collecting data from policy monitoring and planning. Now we should you know use this approach where data is used to make sure we stop the children that are coming that are dropping out and uh, improve attendance and performance. And for this, we need to go down to individual data and to make sure that data is is used more uh, on a routine nature. So, but um, as this uh, one of the biggest challenges in doing this is MIS as a whole lacks what we call turnkey systems, systems that can help us um, do this. Most of our systems are standalone. They don't integrate, you know, they don't, they aren't flexible and you know, I've seen examples on that. And there's limited research as a whole in terms of MIS. But um, that is why we are in the HIS2 uh, here today. So my colleague would, you know, talk about exactly what opportunities the HIS2 has presented us in, 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 in education. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, CD. Um, my name is Monica Amuha. I'm uh, a PhD student still researching about IMIS. And um, so like CD has said, I think we are moving, we are really learning, trying to learn from health, what has happened, what has been um, implemented in the health sector and what lessons can we learn from there to adopt uh, into education, implementation of DHIS2 for education. So as we look at uh, the move from the MDG goals, which were all about having children access uh, school, we are now focused on what is the quality, what is the learning outcome in the SDG goals. So I'll just give a brief country highlights, snapshots of the learnings that um, we've had and also the different implementations that are ongoing in the different countries that Sophia had highlighted. And this basically brings out the different contexts in these countries and trying to really understand the context of the country and see how best you can support them to address their needs. Yeah, so one of the key things uh, that we are talking about, CD ended with the need for decentralizing data. Previously, of course, EMIS has been centralized at national level, but even when it's centralized, uh, there's been limited use. So we've really focused on um, decentralizing data use. And of course, this is uh, the beauty of DHIS2, that it can be accessed at all levels, both central and uh, sub-national levels. So for example, for example, in Uganda, where we are piloting the use of um, DHIS2 as an EMIS, we've seen that um, in the districts where we've implemented with the district education managers and all the planners within the districts really have been empowered to use the data. Previously, they were just conduits of this data from schools and they would just endorse the data, it goes to the center. But now with the DHIS2, they can access their data and they are using that data really to inform their routine plans, allocation of resources such as, you know, redistribution of teachers and also advocacy for additional funds from the partners. And then uh, the other thing, of course, has been that IMIS traditionally has been capturing uh, more or less aggregate data and uh, which has been mostly administrative data. But then we have other data that is within, that is from other systems, such as the examination data, population statistics to enable us to calculate um, some of the indicators that CD talked about, such as gross enrollment, net enrollment. And then, of course, uh, with the DHIS2, we are able to integrate, to have this data uh, integrated into the DHIS2. So we have we have uh, examination data and we are able to calculate the pass index, the performance of these learners uh, based on uh, the data that we have um, imported into the system. And then the other thing, of course, the capability of DHIS2 is being able to share data or exchange data with other existing systems. And in Uganda, we have the EIDSR that is really working in the health sector, doing a monitoring surveillance in the health sector. So during COVID, we're able to have a surveillance module within our DHIS for EMIS instance and exchange data. And this has really improved the collaboration between health and education. Uh, also, CD talked about the 
need for routine data. And of course, we saw that previously there've been annual school census that are done and most of the time they have really been delayed and this data hasn't been used. But uh, we are testing the use of a timely integrated timely data collection tool. And so data is collected on a timely basis. And so you have more frequent data that the planners at the district level and even at the ministry level can use, especially to allocate uh, things like capitation grants that are really have to be allocated on a timely basis. Then at uh, on the really on in the network within the global at global level, we are trying to see what can we learn and how can we build a standard metadata package for EMIS. Of course, EMIS most of the time are uh, what we realize is that we don't have adequate um, a package where countries can either either uh, use to implement or adopt when they are inter when they are taking on the DHIS to for education. So we are trying to understand what are the indicators, how are they presented, and so come up with a standard toolkit and implementation guidance for adoption. Then uh, moving on to the individual level data and which is really a move in the SDG4 goal, really how can we achieve lifelong learning? We are seeing that in the Gambia, we have moved into individual tracking of the learners. So we are able to follow these learners along their continuum of education uh, well from the time they start up to the time they complete and see what are the key issues with these learners, why aren't they learning or what are the, which learners are dropping out or being absent from school. So all these really help us address the learning challenge that is currently uh, um, being faced in most education in the education sector. Then when we talk about, um, uh, we are also piloting the use of a learner and teacher attendance and learner and teacher attendance. This is still in the Gambia and also in Mozambique where we are able to track learners, uh, attendance of these learners. And this is really one of the key indicators of, uh, it's an early warning sign for school dropouts. So we are able to do that. And also in Eswatini still, they are still both tracking individual learners and also teachers. So we need to know what, how many teachers are available, how many learners are available to inform really the education sector planning. So still just to add more on the cross-sectoral synergies, um, we are seeing um, the need for collaboration between education and also other sectors. And here we are getting uh, very good learnings from the collaborational synergies with health. I earlier talked about linkage of data between the education system and the health uh, EIDSR system. But um, during the COVID-19 outbreak, we are able to configure a dashboard in Uganda uh, to configure the system to capture school surveillance data. Of course, most of the surveillance in health has been in the community at the health facilities. But now in schools, we are able to report how many learners have had symptoms related to COVID and all this data was available and we would see which schools were major hotspots and then relay also that data to the health system and have a response team go to schools to support um, the response to the COVID. Uh, also, we have been able to use, because schools are some of the vaccination uh, sites, so we're able to see, to generate, a, to get enrollment data from, from the system and also inform uh, the vaccination campaigns. And this was really working in close collaboration with the health sector. Then in Uganda, I think last year in um, September, we had an Ebola outbreak. So still we're able to configure the system and see how can we add tracking of Ebola. And so we noted that some of the schools were really hot spots for Ebola. So the response team was really uh, got this information and really responded to it. And also during COVID, we had um, we did a national data call quickly in uh had data imported into the system and were able to see a country snapshot of what is our enrollment, how many teachers do we have? And with that, we are able to inform reopening of schools. As you know, Uganda was the last, uh, I think, the country that uh, 
closed schools the longest in the world, I think. And then um, we've had various collaborations with partners and with, uh, for example, World Food Program. We are trying to see how can we pilot uh, implementation of school feeding, monitoring of school feeding in schools. And this is in a region that is really hunger stricken. So those are some of the key learnings. And then of course we have uh, still given the education context, we are trying to see what other other innovations we can build on top of DHIS2. I talked about the learner and teacher attendance uh, tracking, and this is um, these are applications that have been developed on top of the DHIS. We are trying to pilot them and understand how can we track individual, monitor individual learner and teacher attendance, and then also, of course, uh, have these apps. Uh, um, beyond just uh, tracking the learner or uh, the teacher, can we see that these apps are very user-friendly? They are using SMS-based. We are testing that in the Gambia where we have the SMS app. So it's at no cost to the teacher. So this is within a closed user group and the teacher can send the number of learners that are present or absent or teachers that are present or absent on a given day within a given shift. Uh, so that really helps um, to inform still on the, that attendance uh, monitoring indicator. Then also to ensure that we give feedback to schools and also to the communities. We are trying to design a school report cards that, ir that are in an easy to understand format for the school and to easy to interpret. And these school report cards are part, it's an application still that uh, we've developed in the DHIS2 and will be used now to give feedback to the schools and more so to the communities, engaging the parents, the teachers, some of uh, the communities and, and the parents in the communities, some of whom uh, may not be at the same level of understanding to interpret these uh, uh, usual indicators. Then in Sri Lanka, they are going, uh, they are, of course, like uh, in, in Sri Lanka, what they are doing, they are going uh, a separate model. They've started with the capacity building of all the ministry staff, the Ministry of Education staff. So they want to own the system and move at their own pace. But now they are using it, uh, they've used it to carry out a national teacher assessment to assess how many teachers are within the national system. And then from there, they are going to, it's going to inform the next implementation. So more of this will be presented, I think, um, during the DHIS2 conference and the academy that is going to happen in Uganda. And we shall share more on that in the parallel session. So lastly, of course, like Sophia said, we are looking at integration integrations, how can we uh, integrate with existing systems and we are having a use case in Togo and Mozambique um, where we are in integrating DHIS2 with Stat Educ and also with existing uh, uh, data such as mixed ego data. This is a uh, survey data for really to allow cross analysis with the uh, administrative data. So these are all the learnings that we've had in the different countries and uh, we shall be sharing more in the prior session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. And as mentioned, we have two, we have the parallel session at half past 10, but we also have an expert lounge at five o'clock uh, with some of the uh, developers that are working on EMIS applications and the integration work. So please do come have a, have a chat. Um, I'd like to give a very, very warm welcome to two colleagues from the Ministry of Education in Togo. We need to thank you so much for taking the time out of a very busy schedule to come join us and be part of the wonderful DHIS2 for um, the DHIS2 annual conference. So we really appreciate you being here and maybe we can give them a, a round of applause for coming with us. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Kozi Tsali um to give a presentation and i think we have kofi who will be helping us with translation thank you very much sir
Can I do it for you? Mm -hmm. Am I doing it in English? Or oh, maybe you. Up to you. Okay. Let's say along the Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm not uh, Charlie Kossi. Charlie Kossi is uh, the head of office of uh, planning uh, uh, statistic. And uh, let's say uh, uh, assess. Uh, I, I, I want assessment. Yes, assessment uh, department uh, office. So he's one of the, the head of office. Um, if we am uh, in charge of statistics in that office, and uh, I have the pleasure to present uh, what we are doing in Togo with uh, DHIES2. So my presentation will be on three parts. Kofi wanted me to try it in English. That's what I'm... <laughs> 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 because we thought to made a presentation in French, so he will interpret, but while, as I'm coming here, I have the inspiration to do it in English, so that you will. <laughs> okay, we will speak about what we did, that is what we were doing, what we are doing now, and what we intend to do. So, um, the bag on what we, we, we did or we were doing that the evolution of production education data, we did it manual, mechanically, and then we have introduced some application such as AP Info, AP Data, and also CS Pro. But the to in order to have a reliable and complete data produced quickly, we made the choice to go to uh, start Educ, that is an application developed by UNESCO technician to help member countries assess data on the longitudinal plan with uh, MS uh, assess backgrounds. So that helped us to uh, data entry, processing and use with that's our uh, application that is available because we have the many uh, versions of Start Educ 2. Then we, after the collecting of data and we uh, export that data from Start Educ to SS to make some manipulation and we produce also dashboards in Excel with the data we have collected into uh, with the Start Educ. But in 2021, we have made a diagnosis of the tech of statistical information system that shows that we need to go towards uh, an image so as to have an integrated aspect of data use uh, and also analysis, even at the decentralized level. Uh, so what then are the objectives just to have real-time reliable data on the variety, variety of topics in the single database or warehouse data. That will help us also to improve and ensure holistic management of the education system. And then to help us to make decision in the political education so as to how to improve things. And then, uh, uh, we, the Ministry of Education have now signed an, uh, a collaboration frame with, let's say, uh, with um, HISPWCA in Togo to help us. So an, a technical team uh, it has been put in place, composing various stakeholders within our Ministry of Education. And then they have been uh, built up in their capacities to how to configure the DHI2 with what we want to do. And then uh, also in the process, we have collaboration with UNICEF since we are, we are producing already, uh, uh, let's say we are in the project of Data Must Speak with uh, UNICEF. And also we have participated in Miss Eagle 
that is to use some data in the mix uh, to make research on to how to improve the things. And all those things are made by the financement of NORAD and KISS IDLC. And what we have done together, and uh, we have an integrated image platform encompassing geocodes, administrative boundary, and uh, school contact details. We have data on infrastructure, learners, teachers, examinations. We have also the data of NIST survey that are, I say, integrated with in the DSI2. Uh, we have a team, I've also already said it, that we have a team that has been strengthened, uh, a national team, and uh, we have also built up the capacity of some inspectors uh, of primary and secondary school in the uh, pilot zone that we help us. Uh, that is, we want everybody now to go to use the data they are collecting so as to improve the quality of the, this data. Because since if they do not use what they are collecting, they cannot know the problems, the various problems around it. And uh, that's, it's been done with the with GSI2. And here we have started, we have made an interoperability with, uh, that is our application that we are using, Strategic, we have made an interoperability with GHIS2. And uh, if that's here, we are, uh, let's see, some screens of uh, Strategic2. And that interoperability help us to have those graphs that is, that is within DSI2. So the data have been uh, taken from strategy to uh, integrated into DSI2 that help us to produce that graphs. This is the data from uh, uh, mixed eagles that also have been integrated into DSI2. These are, these graphs make sure to make some comparisons or within the data we have collected and then what the survey has been produced. We have here some, let's say, uh, the achievement rates of that have been calculated with our data and then what Mixed Eagle has brought out, yes. So, uh, with GSI2, we are developing some illustrative that dashboards. That's one of our projects we want to do with GSI2. So we have here a photograph of the national team building capacity. Uh, the national team, team of six assisting actors, and then there we have configured uh, with the team of, let's say, GSI2, uh, uh, and their capacity have been built on the opera interoperability with strategy. This can, can go on. Here is the pilot scene zone, that is this project of helping the actors, local actors, to use this data. Uh, that's the project, but the pilot zone is our, let's say, region maritime that's in South in Togo to uh, how to use the data so as to improve his quality. So it is the session of training. So those people have participated, that is the photograph. So what is the next step? The next step is to complete implementation of pilot phase use of data at uh, local level and uh, implementation of an electronic school observation system. And uh, we want to scale up to 81 inspections and seven regions and uh, assure the interoperability with, with, with examination management application because we have many applications 
that are helped to manage many uh, themes, uh, many areas of our education. And then uh, we have also a project of uh, a school ID cards. So uh, a DSIS too will help us to do it. And also uh, this will be based on the unique student identi identification system. That is another project we have started. So we expect that DSI2 will help us within our collaboration. And uh, that's, I think that is all. Yes. Yeah, that was it. So I've tried it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No need of uh, translation of this one. <laughs> Very good indeed. So I will just be very brief to tell a bit about uh, how the Banjul Academy one year ago, I mean, one year, three months ago, um, actually uh, amplified the initiative of this DHS2 for Education. We were able to meet after two years of pandemic. Actually, the, the Academy was planned and we were all having our suitcases when the whole world was locked down in March, 2020. So, the, the energy coming from this Banjul Academy, where we spent five days together only, felt more, with having three days of strategic discussions with all the actors within the, the global actors in the field, the regional actors in the field, the eight Ministry of Education apparent, and the whole Gambia, I would say, all the regions, even the, the West African Examination Office, you know, everyone that could be taking having a stake in the DHS2 for Education was there. We spent we spend, uh, three days, or actually the whole week, with the strategic first conference. Then we divided into two with training for, for most of them, and the rest was making this communique, where we actually made a a, a plan for implementing EMIS, data for education, Pan-Africa, but not only for Africa, but a bit focused on Africa, because African Union was very leading here, and ADEA, which is also part of the African Union, where, where, we, where we carved out in details, it looked like the implementation plan for DHS2, where we carved out in detail how we could work with countries in order to solve the gap of the lack of data in the educational field. And this communique was signed by all these ministries, all these partners, including NORAD actually, not often NORAD is signing on those kind of things, but felt the pressure from African Union on all the others, UNESCO, UNICEF and all. And that communique kind of amplified the, the initiatives throughout the whole Africa and Asia, next, we'll be seeing a lot of growing interest from countries. And we can see the list here and more is coming. And we can see many of them, or oh, you have taken it out, which of them that was actually the Minister of Health that are, are pushing, because the, the, the competition between the education, when, when education see that the beautiful amount of data and analytical tools that the health have, Minister of Health have, the education want to have the same. And the Ministry of Health are the one training in the Ministry of Education. So we can really see the spillover of the capacity in the ministries, in the government, but of course also in the his groups and the region. So with very limited amount of money, because there is not much money in the educational sector. However, the, um, the, the government is very, very uh, energetic and, and eager and maybe have more money locally in country. Um, so there is a huge opportunity of, uh, of leveraging on this capacity that we have in the countries to show how we can actually utilize the, um, the, the tools, the capacity in order to support the Ministry of Education in achieving the SDGs for a better education for all. I will end there. We'll, we'll encourage the, the, the ones that want to have more in-depth uh, knowledge about it. We have a parallel session just after the coffee break. And we also have an academy in Kampala and Teb actually.
to be honest. Sorry for that one. Uh, in August, so so that's just to, to run for registration, and we will continue the great work and report uh, next year the new achievements. Thank you. Okay, and so that's the end of the plenary sessions for today. We have parallel sessions going for the rest of the morning and afternoon. Now we have a coffee break out in the lobby, and then we'll be starting up uh, around 1030 in the parallel session rooms across the patio. Uh, 